So, hey everybody, welcome, thank you for joining. Uh, I see there's a, probably a lot of people that are at breakouts right now, so <laughs> small audience here today. But that's fine, uh, makes it more personal. So if you guys want to stop and ask questions at any point, please, you're welcome to, I encourage it. Uh, my name is Paul Lesiak. I am a solutions architect with the Cisco Advanced Services ACI practice. So I've been working with the NCME business unit, or formerly NCME, now INSBU, for the last two years, working on ACI, uh, specifically around the APIs. So that's essentially everything that I've been working on, working with partners for enabling them to make their products work with ACI, integrating, allowing them to leverage the APIs more effectively on how to actually get that full end-to-end -end integration between what ACI can do and then what other vendors can do and how they can add value to what ACI is capable of providing. So the topic today is ACI deep dive on the, the APIs. So uh, here's a brief introduction of, or I'm sorry, uh, agenda of what we're going to cover today. Uh, we'll go through some introductory topics to sort of uh, get your minds going, you know, switch over into this appli application-centric way of thinking. We'll uh, go through the programmatic interfaces that ACI offers, and then go into some of the real meat about how the API and SDK works there. So how you can work with the REST interfaces, how you can work with the SDK, so on and so forth. Then. You know, you're going to want to know how to get started. If you come out of the session without knowing you know, how to take your laptop and uh, get all of the necessary documentation and Python modules, all of that installed, then I failed. So please come up and you know, maybe punch me or at least scold me, because I want you to be able to do this after you've come out of the session. We'll go through some best practices. Uh, I've learned a lot about this product about these interfaces over the last couple of years, so I want to make sure that I impart some of that knowledge from me to you guys. And we'll go through applicability, like where other people are using this, and then finally wrap things up. So does that look good to everyone? Yes? No? OK, yes, good enough. So before we get into the introduction here, um, how many people in the audience uh, are familiar with ACI? Have some familiarity. OK, great. A uh, little bit, OK. So um, how many of you are developers by trade? OK, a couple. Uh, how many of you are network focused guys? OK, so uh, for the, the developers by trade, uh, there's a lot of content in here that is very much uh, code specific. But it seems a majority of the people in the audience are network based guys, and I might uh, sort of go a little bit into too much detail beyond what you're interested in. So what I'm hoping to do is at least give you the references, give you the information, and then you have the slides to go back to to see, you know, hey, you know, he talked about how we can do these lookups by class or by DN or whatnot. How do I actually implement that? And so you'll have this to go back to and at least give you some of the theory. For the uh, developers in the crowd, please feel free to stop and ask me more questions if I'm not going into enough detail. So goals for this session. I, I want to introduce you to what ACI, what the uh, APIC data center can do. That's going to be a brief overview, but at least to sort of uh, prime your minds to begin thinking about that. Educate you about the programmatic interfaces so you'll know what's there give you the steps to get started with that SDK, and then, again, provide those best practices, all the stuff, the agenda. What is not in scope for the session is giving a very comprehensive course on Python. Uh, if you're not familiar with Python, then um, you know, it's one of those things that it could take a week or two, potentially longer if you don't have any programming background, to become familiarized with. So uh, that's something that's not in scope there. I'm also, uh, I don't plan on doing a comprehensive class on ACI simply because it's a huge solution uh, in and of itself. So it's very, very difficult to teach that in a one hour session that we have here. So as far as leveraging programming, let's look a little bit about why it's applicable. So why do you want to leverage these programmatic interfaces? Well, for the first item that I think everybody would agree upon, speed. 
how many people think that they can go and configure a router quicker than some script could do it? Anybody? OK, so I, I'm glad because, I mean, I, I type pretty quickly, but I, I can't beat something that's, that's uh, written to actually do it. I just don't have that ability to type so quickly. Uh, efficiency and cost, right? A perfect tie-in to doing things in an automated fashion is that you're going to increase your efficiency. If you, I mean, look at the Industrial Revolution. As machines began to do some of these tasks, uh, it just wasn't possible for one guy at the assembly line to go and build engines as, as quickly. Machines are just going to be better at doing it because they're custom made for it. And computers are very good at doing the same thing over and over again. But people have to teach those computers how to do it. And that's why this programmability is so important. And then the quality, of course, right? How well the, the consistency of the information that comes out of the system uh, is applied is going to be directly tied to how well your code is written and then how well it's able to consistently execute. One person, people are just not very good at doing the same thing over and over again. You get tired. You start to fat finger things. Yes, a lot of things get into muscle memory, but we just can't, can't do it. We, we wear out after a while. So who is interested, right? Uh, again, I mentioned a lot of partners that I'm dealing with. Uh, the list is, is probably you know, three or four uh, pages deep in terms of partners that we're, we're going with. There's a lot of them that uh, I'm interacting with on a daily basis. And they're very interested in leveraging ACI and the programmatic aspects on how to actually go and automate these, these products. Uh, customers, I'm also working with a ton of customers. I am in the advanced services group. So I see that uh, customers are actively looking to leverage these technologies, these new interfaces, to go and automate their networks. They're not looking at doing things in a, in a very manual fashion anymore. A lot of them are not looking to leverage even off-the-shelf products for this. They want to go and build it in-house the same way that a lot of customers are going and building OpenStack portals in-house or maybe internal IT provisioning portals, that they want to do the same thing around ACI and begin to automate that on their own. Uh, system integrators, uh, Cisco, within the Cisco IT organization, there's a whole lot of automation and orchestration that's taking place. So essentially, everyone. I, I, could, I bet that you know, we could probably pick a few people out of uh, uh, beyond the audience around here, and they're probably saying, yes, I'm looking at automation. Yes, I'm looking at programmability, because it's a really hot topic nowadays. So I'm glad you guys are here to learn about this, because it's really going to help you increase your value as engineers. So the how, right? This is the most important part, I think, because you can have the motivation. You can be the right person. But until you know how to do it, you're not going to be able to get there. So what are we going to look at doing? We want to automate common tasks. Those could be troubleshooting tasks. Those could be uh, maybe monitoring tasks, gathering information, sort of uh, processing it to display it in a better fashion than, than what is natively available out of the system. So that's a, a big one. Deployment tasks. I've got a lot of customers that are using the APIs on ASIC to do huge deployments, like taking on a, on a, a cloud stack environment where you need to provision 1,000 VLANs on every single interface across hundreds of leaves. If you go and you try to do that manually, I guarantee you're going to be in there for weeks clicking through buttons to do it. And so we've worked with them to, to automate these processes where it's done in a matter of minutes, which is a really, really great benefit of this. So we know how to leverage the programmability now. Let's go into a little overview about what ACI provides you. So the ACI solution is a really comprehensive and, and uh, uh, wide-scaled uh, solution. It's not looking to just address network problems. It's not looking to just address layer two mobility or anything to that. There's innovations that go all the way up and down the stack, from the physical layer up to the application layer. So at the physical layer, we've introduced all sorts of new technologies, including uh, 40 gig bi die optics, uh, uh, mid-planeless chassis, so the fabric connects directly into the line cards. Uh, we've got uh, 
new merchant plus silicon. So there's, there's a whole bunch of innovations that just take place at the hardware level. But we've gone a step above that, right? We've made new innovations on the network side. So using ISIS with non-IP based interconnectivity between the spines and the, the individual leaf nodes, right? Uh, all of the, the discovery of the fabric is automated. So you're no longer going and building out on a node by node basis. The management is done across the board through your APIC controller. So there's a, a great amount of innovation there at the network layer. Look at the virtualization layer, right? We've gone and we've very, very tightly coupled with hypervisors that can connect to the fabric. So when you create a network policy, it gets pushed down into the hypervisors so that you're no longer going there and manually stitching VLANs to go from your leaf to your virtual switch. Instead, it's automatically created for you, and you can go and begin to place workloads in there. Now, imagine what you could do if you pair that with the automation capabilities of a lot of these compute and virtualization platforms with a fully automated fabric. That means that 100% of your IT provisioning process could be automated, which is like the holy grail of all IT operations. So it's a fantastic advantage there. And then I touched upon the application tier. We've got this new way of modeling applications use, using what, what are called application profiles. And with this technology, with this methodology, we don't look at representing applications as just VLANs or subnets or maybe a set of access controls. But rather, we model the complete application with the different tiers of it, look at the web tier, the, the application tier, the database tier, the communications between them, and then map them accordingly, and push that down into the infrastructure. So it's a very holistic solution that works on many different levels, and so makes it very, very powerful in terms of what you can do. So in terms of the, the uh, semantics that we're dealing with, ACI takes application level semantics and ensures that there is no loss of data going down from ACI into the configuration. You have a complete picture going from the top down into the bottom. It also allows, as I mentioned earlier, you've got the APIC, which is like that central point of management, but not a single point of failure. That gives you a singular view into the fabric that provides you a bunch of information about statistics, information, counters, faults, uh, configuration. All of that is available through the APIC, but it looks like a singular entity. So you're no longer managing switch by switch, looking at you know, what is the, the OSPF neighbor state on this device? What is it here? How do I sort of correlate the two of them? You have a singular view of the fabric, so it acts like a single monolithic entity. Now finally, all of this is based about open standards and open APIs. So we haven't gone and created a solution that's extremely proprietary. We want to, to make it available to others to go and integrate with. So if you wish to add some new functionality to your, your ACI fabric, you're not limited to what Cisco can do. You're not limited to what a third party can do. You can go and actually extend it yourself, either via the northbound API or southbound API. So you have a lot of possibilities, a lot of new ways to extend it. Now, all of this configuration is not based on what we're used to in the current days of router and switch configurations. Uh, I'm sure, how many people in this room have gone in and typed conf t on a router or a switch? OK, everybody, I, I, I hope, right? Even for the developer guys, you've probably done it at least once or twice. Um, well, conf t is gone. I'm sorry to say it, it's, it's no longer there. The way that we now represent configuration is through this very object-oriented object model. And what the object model is meant to do is take every aspect of what can be configured within a data center, the, the network layer, but also including compute and application, and represent that in an object-oriented fashion. So now, an OSPF router is no longer router OSPF 10, and then an area, area idea, ID under that, um, you know, some, some authentication property, so on and so forth. Instead, it's an object called an OSPF router, which has properties on it that can be set. 
and that OSPF router will have children beneath it that define the interfaces that are part of that. And so when you go and you query for OSPF routers, you can deal with those in a very programmatic fashion. And I'll show you in a little bit how we can do that. Again, it's a tree-based hierarchy. So if you're familiar with the SNMP MIB tree, you're familiar with the MIT. You know how to sort of go down through the different layers and you know, look at the, the, the top layer, CD into lower layers, get more information on it. It's got different branches to address various layers of functionality. So as an example, the policy universe configures all of the tenancy, all of the contracts and how objects intercommunicate. You've got the compute universe. That's where you'll see all of the physical compute nodes and all of those other entities. So there's a lot of uh, different areas here that are described, and they have different logical branches to contain that information. Each of these individual blue dots here, which very, very simplified. The blue dots are a little bit easier to comprehend than having full uh, C++ code on the screen. But each of those little blue dots is a managed object. And so when you hear the term managed object, you're essentially referencing one of these devices, or I'm sorry, one of these nodes that has been instantiated. So there is a very fundamental difference between a class and a managed object. A class is really just the definition of something, whereas a managed object is the instantiated instance of that particular uh, node. Each of those managed objects has a class and a distinguished name. So that tells me what it is and then who it is. So you're able to differentiate between those very, very clearly. And then finally, this is a very critical component to program programmatic interaction with APIC. All of the, the dealings that you're going to work with APIC on through the northbound API are going to be done through this object model. So it's an important topic to sort of have your head start to wrap around. So speaking of the programmatic interfaces, I talked a little bit about northbound and southbound. Here's a little bit more detail about just exactly what those are. So the northbound interface is essentially from the top, from outside of the fabric, entities that wish to program APIC are going to do that through the northbound API. So if you have automation tools, orchestration tools, you write a couple of scripts that are going to maybe go and query information from the fabric and uh, pipe it out to external entities, you'll do that through the northbound API. And that northbound API is enabled through the REST interface and the COBRA SDK. The southbound API, on the, on the other hand, is how APIC is able to take its knowledge, its declarative state of the network, the desired state, and push that down to other entities. So through protocols like OpFlex and through built-in sub-APIs within APIC, like device packages. It's able to take the intent, the desired programmatic state that you push in through the northbound API, and then push it down to subordinate entities that APIC is managing. And that makes for a very powerful way to allow for you to not have to go and say, I'm going to automate 90% of my fabric, but instead, I'm going to automate 100% of it, because now I can take all this policy that I'm pushing in and get it down into the firewalls, the load balancers, maybe other switches and hypervisors that are connected to the fabric. So as far as the REST interface goes on the northbound side, that's where the uh, majority of the scope of this session is. Uh, the southbound API itself is a very, very, very uh, big animal, right? There's a lot of uh, details to it. There's white papers on CCO that you could read about if you want to know more about that, if you're interested in developing device packages. But for the scope of the session, we, there's just too much there to cover. So let's go into what the northbound API provides to us. So given that we're very dedicated at Cisco to leveraging these APIs, to making programmatic interaction something that all of our customers can consume, we're also eating our own dog food, right? So our GUI, our CLI, web browser access that you make uh, to, the, to the APIC, all the API tools, the SDK itself, all of them are going and talking to this REST API. We don't do any, any tricks where we say, oh, well, you know, this function is not exposed to the REST API, so we're going to go there and, and do it some tricky way that you guys don't have access to. No, 
everything that you want to do with the fabric that we do through the CLI, through the, the REST interface, I'm sorry, through the GUI, all of that is done through this, this REST API. And you can use that REST API to access your APIC cluster, your leaves, your spines, everything that's in the fabric. So we've, we're, we're very open about this. And this is very beneficial to you guys who are going to be uh, uh, deploying this, because now there's nothing that is, is hidden away from you. You're available, or you're, you're able to access all of that. As far as features and functionality of the REST API, uh, it is based on native REST, so uh, it's got all the benefits there, stateless, um, uh, you know, is, is HTTP-based, self-documenting, all of that. We've got an extremely robust querying and filtering interface, and I'll show you some more details about that. Now, in that object model, I talked about how much information is provided there. Well, if you have all this information in the world, it's not very good to have it there without being able to filter through it to sort of figure out what's there. So we've provided a very, very powerful filtering and querying mechanism there. There's no artificial divide between your configuration and administrative state. And what that means is that on a router or a switch today, you go and you issue show commands to get your operative or administrative state, right? And then, or rather, just the operable state. And then you use conf-t to change administrative state, to change the configuration. So there's this, this divide between them. You can, you can see show run to see what I'm trying to do. And then you do like a show int or show IPOSPF neighbors to see how things are actually running. And this can be you know, a bit troublesome, especially when you're doing things programmatically, because you can no longer rely on one source of information to get everything that you need. Instead, you have to do multiple queries and look for it in multiple different places. So this is a very, very powerful and important uh, parameter here. Uh, the object model supports the ability to overload the state of certain attributes there so that if you want to write a stateless application that just goes and uses APIC as your, your data store, how you're going to, to uh, manage programmatic state in there. You can overload fields in there, the description fields, the owner key, owner state, all of those, so that your application can go and sort of establish its state there. So you can read back and see, hey, what did my app do here? Keep track of what maybe was a change that you made versus what was a change that a user made manually. So you can ensure that the state is consistent. And then finally, all of the objects that are in the object model do in fact support event-driven notifications. So when things change on the fabric, you're no longer left to polling and repeatedly asking at a given interval what is happening, but you're able to get notifications immediately. Question? Just what you talked about a yes. minute ago, configured an operational state provided through the same interface. Does it mean that I should not, must not, cannot actually go and do conf there on the devices? That's if correct. The, there, there is no conf term on the devices uh, anymore. The question was, can you use conf t on any of these leaves and spines? And the answer is no. Conf t is, is disabled as a, a CLI. Yeah, but the controller will also go and configure ASA or Netscale or something like this. So I should not go there. I mean, I can, right? Go to Netscaler, for example, and do something, but probably I should not. That, that question has a very detailed answer, and maybe afterwards we can discuss it. But essentially, it, it depends on how the device package vendor mm -hmm. has implemented their device package. That's going to determine whether or not you can go and, and manually configure them. If, if, if you're OK with it, maybe come up afterwards. We can have a long discussion about that. So again, event notification. You can get uh, interrupt-driven feedback to your application so you're not sitting there constantly checking it. So we've got some background on object model, what we can do. Now let's get started, right? Let's make this into something uh, where you can make it tangible. So the first thing to get, to get in your mind here is this REST API. So the REST API is a standard REST interface. You've got get, you've got post, you've got delete. You don't have put because they sort of 
merged put and post together. But essentially, all of these operations follow the standard REST definition. Get is used for reads. That's a nilipotent operation. So if you do a get, it's if you run it zero or more times, the result will always be the same if nothing has changed on the back end. So essentially, it is to say it's a read-only operation. By doing it, you don't change anything. Post and delete, those are both idempotent operations, meaning that if you execute them one or many times with the same input, they're going to result in the same output. So as an example, if I go and try to create the same tenant over and over again, it's not going to create a duplicate tenant. Instead, it's just going to go into the APIC API and say, hey, this tenant already exists. I don't have to duplicate it. So that's an important thing to understand here, especially when you're dealing with it programmatically, because you're, you're not forced to check, you know, did I already create this? Is, is this here yet? Instead, you could just say, hey, I need this to exist. Let me create it. The only case where you might want to check is you know, if there's two people that have conflicting configs or otherwise. But essentially, from a programming standpoint, you don't have to make those uh, preliminary checks on it. Uh, all of this is sort of detailing the, the, the REST-based attributes of it. Any APIC in the cluster can handle it. It is stateless. Sessions and requests can be sent to any APIC in the cluster. And if you want to access leaves or spines, you can do that through the APIC. So you're not limited to just talking to the APIC. You can talk to any node in the fabric. And again, the goal of this REST API is to give you the ability to read and write and, and modify objects. So as far as reading goes, this is going to be your primary interface into pulling information out of the REST API. So you can see here it's a fairly simple HTTP URL. Uh, the first part of it is really just your, your host. You're saying it's going to be an API op operation. But then somewhere in the middle over here, we see the ability to talk to either an MO or a class. Well, an MO is a managed object. I talked about how every node in the tree is a managed object. That's what we mean here. So if I want to go and talk to something specific, like an individual EPG, EPG being an endpoint group that represents a, a grouping of logical entities on the fabric, I would reference that as an MO. If I want to talk to a certain set of classes, I can do that by making a class-based query. So I could say, get me all of the information on layer one physical interfaces, which is sort of like if you wanted to do a, uh, a show int and then include on uh, 10 gig interfaces. That's how you would go and do the equivalent on the ACI fabric. Uh, the rest of these parameters are really just giving more details, more uh, quantifiers about what you're trying to do. Filtering, uh, just returning certain objects with certain attributes, all, all of that. So that takes care of reading information out. What about if you want to push information into the REST API? Well, that's where these create and update operations are used. And this is essentially a post that's going to include a URI that describes what you want to do, and then a payload that's going to be either XML or JSON that describes what it is that you're going to post there. So we see here we've got a payload that includes a tenant. The FV in front of this tenant is the package name. The tenant is the class name. And ultimately, what that does is create a new tenant in the fabric. We create an application profile. So we've got fabric virtualization as the package, application profile as the class name, and that's going to create those certain objects in there. And then we go and we attach an interface within an EPG to that application profile. So essentially, what you've done here is you've said, I am making this interface be part of this EPG. So if you look at the way you do it today, when you go and you say, switch port access VLAN, what am I using here? Uh, VLAN 1, that's essentially what you're doing here, but for an EPG. So that payload is just a, a XML or JSON representation of what your desired intent is. Now, given that we have the ability to read and write information out of the REST API, we also want to have the ability to browse through it, because you don't want to have to go and write read queries to get every little bit of information out of there. You would like to be able to browse them. So for that purpose, we have this object browser called Visore. And Visore uh, in Italian means viewer. 
Uh, is there anybody Italian in the audience? Can you confirm that for me? Does, it does mean viewer, right? OK, good. Thank you. Because I've only been told this by the developer who is Italian. He may have been lying to me. Uh, and that object viewer, that browser, allows you to find information about objects in the object model. So in this case, we're looking at a top system object. And we get all sorts of information about it. We get its address on the fabric. We get the distinguished name for it. So remember the managed object ID? Each of those has a distinguished name, which shows who it is. And this is what that distinguished name looks like. We get information about who it is in the fabric, MAC address, all of these details. So from a viewpoint of dealing with this programmatically, Vizore is going to be a very, very useful tool in your toolbox because you're going to be able to see in the current state of the MIT, what do these objects read back? How can I use that within my program to extract more information and make it more rich and show more details? So it's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, here are a couple of pointers just on how to access it. And you can do both class-based queries and object-based queries uh, on Visore. So Visore is good for seeing what's already there. But what if you want to see how the GUI or how the CLI are making configuration changes? Well, for this purpose, we have this tool called the API Inspector. And the API Inspector is really, it's, it's like Wireshark, but for the GUI of, of APIC. So if I am going in there, I'm very new to APIC, and actually I still do this today, right? I don't know how to, how to do in the API what the GUI is doing because uh, there's you know, a lot of moving pieces in there, or maybe it's dealing with objects I'm not familiar with. So what I can do is use this API inspector to actually sniff what the gets, what the posts are, see what the payloads are, and then sort of see how I can duplicate that on my own. So a quick example of walking through how this would work. We're going and we're creating a tenant here. It's a little bit small, but that tenant is called Cisco. So we go through in, in the GUI, create a new tenant. Then it's going to ask us for some more details. It's going to ask us for a VRF that we want to add to it. In this case, uh, you know, I think I, I added one in the workflow, but we'll take a look. But we add that information. And then finally, in the API inspector, and this is what it looks like. It's really just sort of a logger. It shows you all of the calls that have been made. So some of this is pretty small, but if you uh, look at the slides afterwards, you'll see there's a bunch of gets taking place to see what is there. You'll also see that there's a bunch of, or there's at least one post at the bottom. And that last post happens to correlate to the request that I just made to create that new tenant. So over here, you can see that I've posted to this APIC with this request URI, which probably looks familiar from a few slides ago when we had how to write information into the REST API. And then here's the payload in, in JSON. So you can see here all of that theory that we just talked about is actually applicable and visible very easily consumable. This, yes, question. How does the authentication work? So authentication is something that I'll, I'll cover in a little bit. Uh, there's, it's, it's a separate actual call that's made, but we'll go through this. These calls are all authenticated. What's shown in the, the API inspector does not include all of the authentication tokens, all of that, because it's assumed that if you got to API inspector, you already know what your authentication credentials are and all that. And actually, you're going to see it in two, three slides, so a very, very relevant question. So again, you've got details as to how you can go and interact with the REST API just based on sort of watching and learning. So getting started. These are the sort of steps we're going to go through now. Here's a guy helping a lady find a topic in a book. I thought it sort of fit well together. I don't know. But anyway, the first things you're going to need, the SDK and the documentation. Again, this is a reference slide. Um, please go and download these slides after the presentation. They'll be available on the, the DevNet page, and you'll be able to have all this for reference. But the, the Python SDK is available on DevNet. So is the documentation on the model reference. Uh, and you can also access that on your APIC if you happen to have one. So once you get the SDK going and installed, uh, you're ready to move forward. One note to uh, remember, if you're going to download the eggs from your APIC, make sure to rename them. There's a document 
right down here in the bottom that explains uh, the process there. So just hit that URL, and I shortened it, so it might be a little bit easier to, to type. But hit that, and then it'll provide more details there. But so uh, just some steps you have to go through to get it working. But once you've got all of this information sort of pre-populated, then we go into the topic of authentication. So what do those authentication requests look like? Well, I've got both of these side by side over here. We've got the REST requests, and we've got the COBRA requests. So on the REST side, it's fairly straightforward. We send a post, preferably via HTTPS. Uh, by default, HTTP is, is disabled. So you know, if you want to enable that, do so at your own peril. But uh, I would prefer you did HTTPS. And we post a request to this API slash MO slash AAA login. So there's a set of REST calls that are specific to sort of these non-authenticated operations that are documented in the REST user guide, which is also from the last slide. And AAA login is one of those. And what we're going to have in the payload is essentially username and password. And what we get back from that is an authentication token. So that authentication token is going to give us our 64, I'm sorry, our base 64 encoded uh, cert that essentially says, here's what identifies you as you. And if you include it with the rest of your requests, they're going to be authenticated. If you do this through the SDK, it's a little bit simpler because you don't have to go and track all of that. You don't have to go and build your posts, all that. Simply a matter of importing the appropriate Python modules. And then you create a login session. You log into that uh, uh, MO directory, which is what it's called because you're accessing managed objects. And then you've got a session that's authenticated. So authentication is fairly straightforward. Uh, there's not a lot of tricks to it. The one thing I would uh, mention is that aside from doing a standard login session, you also have the ability to do a cert-based session. So that means that if you have a program that's going and logging in and doing tricks, maybe you don't want to use a username and a password to modify the APIC, but instead you want to say, give my program a certificate that he's going to, to store locally in a secure place as a private key, and then he'll authenticate, uh, authenticate with APIC to uh, see what he can do based on that certificate. So that's also documented in the Python SDK, just how you can do that in case you want some more information on that. So we have the ability to log into the APIC to establish a session. Now let's look at getting started with pulling information out of it, some really, really simple, straightforward objects. So again, REST and COBRA examples side by side. Uh, to me, I always go the, the COBRA side. You, you're not going to find me going and writing a lot of direct REST calls, simply because COBRA does all of the work for you. You don't have to go and remember any complex REST syntax. You don't have to go and manually parse any of the XML. Instead, you get all the information back in nicely structured objects that sort of tell you what is, uh, what, is what and what is a DN, what is a property, all that. So in any case, if you want to go the REST approach, well then, we're going to say, get API slash class. So I'm doing a class-based query. And I want to look up all of the objects that are of type FVSEP. So remember, the FV is the package name. So that's fabric virtualization. And then the SEP part, this is client endpoint. So essentially, what this is going to give me is all of the servers, all of the hosts that are attached to my fabric. That's what that client endpoint means. And what I get back in this information is the MAC address of it, the IP address of it, if it happens to have an IP. In this case, uh, I was using a layer two bridge domain, so it didn't have one associated with it. And it also tells me the containment of what application and what EPG gives you. So if you just think about this, uh, how can that information be leveraged? Well, it means that I can go and query for every server on the network and be able to know what application it belongs to. And that could be a very powerful thing for just resolving your CMDBs, your single source of truth, trying to make sure that what you have that's documented is accurate with what is the operable state in your network. You could use it for a whole bunch of other things, but that's just one idea as to how it could be useful. We could do the same thing with Cobra by simply doing a lookup by class, which again means that I'm looking up for the, the what rather than the who. So I'm saying, find me all the client endpoints. And then 
I'm just doing a, this is a very compact loop over here. So again, for the Python programmers, probably makes perfect sense for uh, anybody with a network background. Uh, if you want to learn more about how this works, look up list comprehensions, Python list comprehensions, and you'll find out all about that. It's really just a way for lame people like me to show off that I can combine everything in one line, but that's. So again, our output is we've printed out all the distinguished names for these objects. Uh, a little tip down here, if you wanted to maybe debug Cobra to see, hey, what's the rest call that it's making to do what I'm calling over here, it's very simple. Import HTTP lib and then set the debug flag to true or to, to one there. So that's sort of a, a simple example of using a, a lookup by class. Let's take it a little step further and do a, a slightly more complex query. So that lookup by class that we did is really just another wrapper around this dot query method. And the dot query method exists on our MO directory object. So over here, what I've done is defined a function that's just a recursive displayer, a recursive printout of what's in my object hierarchy. And I'm building a class query. So whereas on the previous screen, I was using lookup by class, on this screen, I'm saying build an actual class query and then set some attributes on that class query. So when I set these attributes, it actually goes and sets query string parameters in my lookup. So then when I go and execute this dot query, I print out the entire nested hierarchy of my class structure. So what you can see here is that the output says, you know, print tree endpoints, and I get my FE set. But I also see that there's a bunch of other information underneath it. All of this other rich, useful information is included in the MIT. And if I were to print out more details about it, I would find out what the name of the virtual NIC that's attached to this endpoint is. I would also find out what the name of the VM that it's sitting on, it's residing on is. I could find out what the path to that particular node on the fabric is, who the hypervisor is, all this information. So like, you could imagine just by doing a simple thing like looking up client endpoints, uh, what type of information you could find out, and then leverage that very effectively in applications that you're creating. So it's a really powerful, powerful object model with a lot of information you can query out of it. So in that last slide, uh, I sort of showed you the dot subtree uh, filter parameter. Well, there's a bunch of others here that map between the REST API and the Cobra SDK. This slide, please think of it as a reference because I doubt that anybody in the back row can read this. So uh, you know, maybe get the slides afterwards and you can read through this. But it's very you know, handy to print out at your uh, cubicle and put it up on the wall just for if you're pr coding with this fairly often. But essentially, it's a matter of how you map the query strings to the uh, SDK. So we've got an idea as to how we can query and read information out of the REST SDK or the REST API. Now, how do we write information to it? Well, again, there's the REST method and then there's the COBRA method. Essentially, in the REST method, we're saying let's build a tenant, set some properties on him, and then post him. And that goes and creates that tenant. And remember, it's a idempotent operation. So I could do this 100 times, 50 times, a million times, and it's not going to make a difference. It's going to be the same result. Here we see how we can do this using the Cobra SDK. So what we go through is we build the objects, what we want to do. We add them to a commit request or to a, a config request, and then we commit them. So build, add, commit. And that's sort of the process you're going to go through. And that will actually go and create objects for you. So you see here that the code on the right to actually build that object hierarchy is a little bit lengthy because you have to go in and tell it what you're talking about. Well, I am lazy, I'm very, very, very lazy. And I found myself doing this a lot, and I didn't want to have to write the code manually. So what I did is I created this tool called ARIA. And ARIA is essentially a tool that allows you to take XML or JSON code that you capture either using the API inspector or your uh, Visore tool, or really any of the other ways that you can extract the XML or JSON from APIC. And you feed that in as XML or JSON, and it spits out the Cobra code for you. 
So like, if you're a networking guy that is maybe a little bit, uh, you know, not, not looking forward to approaching Python or learning how to program, or maybe this seems like it, it might be too complex, go to this URL right here, look at ARIA, download it. It's going to be your best friend if you want to go and create rapid prototypes for configuring and automating your APIC. It's going to allow for you to very rapidly develop code. So it's a fantastic tool from that extent. So I wanted to give you a little use case here, just how you can leverage all these pieces of information. So simple use case here. I want to get my OSPF neighborship uh, information. So in this case, you know, it's a typical operation to go and check what your neighbors are. Let's go and do that, not just for a single leaf, a single border leaf on my fabric, but do it for all of the border leafs on the fabric. And even take it a step further and show me what faults are present. So, you know, this guy seems he has two, two uh, faults on there. Let's see what those faults are. So we've got a simple set of code over here. In the top part, we're fetching our OSPF neighbors. To do that, we just query our OSPF adjacencies EP class. And you can get this information, again, by looking through API Inspector and looking at the GUI. We're also including a subtree include that says, show me the faults on it. And then once we have that information, it's gotten all of our OSPF neighbors. And then all we have to do is go ahead and print it out in a fashion that's similar to how iOS or NXOS does it. So let's see what this, what this gives us. I go and I run this script, and it prints out for me, again, very similar to iOS and NXOS, the neighbor ID, the priority of that neighbor, what the state of that routing uh, adjacency is or neighborship is, shows me the address of that tier, and even the node the leaf that is trying to communicate with it. So again, if you don't want to go and have to check the OSPF state on every single uh, individual leaf in the fabric using the GUI, you can go ahead and use that script that's right on the screen and have it check it for all of them. And not only that, but we also print out the faults that are present on those. So in this case, the first one, we see that it's stuck in the xstart state. So it's not, not going and actually creating a, an adjacency. Uh, we see that actually a couple of them are stuck in that state. This last one, I think I configured a non-existent OSPF node there to get that. So you see what's, what's uh, being spit out there. So again, we, we have an idea as to how the object model works, how you can read information out of the REST API, how you can write it, how you can do queries, even have an example of how to, to go and actual, actually implement a useful use case. So now let's go into best practices. Now, a lot of this stuff is information that I've learned on my own because I've done it and I've failed miserably and I found that, hey, you know what, I should probably figure out a better way to do this or you know, maybe it's, it's just not the right way. So uh, a lot of this is, is uh, failure that I've experienced that I want to help you guys avoid. So please write these down somewhere and when you're writing code, you know, just sort of uh, reference them. So, Here's some of the topics I'm going to cover, and this is just sort of like the sub-agenda, so I'm not going to go through them. Instead, let's start jumping into them. So within that object model, right, that tree-based hierarchy, what you'll find is that there are a lot of references between objects. And what I mean by the references is that one managed object might point to another one. So if I want to have an EPG that goes and adds a, an interface to it, that's going to be a reference. It's going to go from one object to another. And when you're going and creating these, these references, it's highly discouraged to hard code those references. So as an example, in this code sample up, up here, I'm not going and attaching an actual object. I'm going and attaching the string that represents the distinguished name of that object, which is typically a bad practice because I've just hard coded that in there. If that interface changes or if maybe the structuring of those distinguished names changes, that could bite me in the long run. You know, I'm going to have to go and find somewhere in my code where am I statically building these strings. So instead, it's highly recommended to use a lookup. Find out what this object is, figure out who it is, and then use the .dn or maybe the .name property on it to reference that particular string that would otherwise be hard coded. So that's, that's the first one here. And this one is a really important one. You know, we go through it a few times. It really just goes back to avoiding hard coding in your code. It's a fairly best practice in general. 
Uh, commit and query granularity. So when we look at the REST API, again, it's a directory-based structure. So if you go into maybe uh, your root directory on a Linux box, and you do a find command there, and you say find this, this specific file, it's not going to go and get just uh, search just the directory that you're looking in. It's going to look through all of the directories. So that means it's going to be very slow. It's not going to be a quick operation. So that's why when you're doing commits and queries on the REST API, for the same reason, you want to avoid doing things at the top level and instead do them, do them at a very specific level, as specific as you can get. So let me show you what I mean by that. Right? I want to add a new endpoint group. And that endpoint group is going to be part of a tenant called Cisco, an application called New EPG, and I'm going to call it New EPG. Now, if all of this information here exists, then I want to go and not just add the top of it, because I'm going to have to tell APIC, all right, add this, or go into this tenant, go into this EPG, go into this particular uh, uh, endpoint group that I want to add, and then it's going to have to go and navigate through those directories. Instead, I can go and say, no, just add the EPG that I've added. So then my query string, my, my actual post URL, is going to be very specific to the point about this EPG is what I'm working on, as opposed to saying I'm working at the top level. So that's sort of what I mean by that example. Uh, a note, this techie, technique is not going to work if the hierarchy above what you're dealing with does not yet exist. So just a, a heads up on that one. If you're creating a new tenant, you're going to need to create that tenant and sort of work through it. Again, I mentioned avoiding hard coding distinguished names. So in this case, up at the top line, we see that we've got a from string on the DN method to look up a particular DN. Now, within APIC, a lot of the very critical classes, the managed objects, luckily for us, they have fairly static distinguished names. So common things like the infrastructure uh, management, uh, management tree branch is something that's fairly hard coded. So instead of having to go and resolve it from a hard coded DN and sort of build it out, I can instead go and create the objects that are going to be static that represent it and then go and add some interface policy on it. So in this case, I'm simply creating a new LACP link aggregation profile. So instead of going in and saying, OK, here's my DN for it, and then I want to create it there, I can instead build the hierarchy to it and then reference it. So this is a fairly, uh, you know, it's not 100% applicable, but if you can, follow this rule. This sort of plays into the next one, right? How many people think that it's quicker to go and say, look up something from the APIC, get the DN back, and then go and post something to that DN versus going and saying, here's what my DN is, go and post it. Anybody want to say the first option is faster than the second? Good. You guys are all very smart because it's not, right? You're doing two queries over the network instead of one query over the network. So when you can, avoid doing a lookup by class or a lookup by DN on hard, uh, on static DNs because it'll make your program a lot quicker to execute. You're just going to issue the one post or the one uh, uh, REST query to get to that information while building all of it in local memory, and then it can be immediately used. So it's a lot faster. This next best practice is sort of, I mean, it's both in, uh, uh, in conflict and in agreement with the Zen of Python. Does anybody know what the Zen of Python is? If you go into a Python interpreter and you type in help this, it has this, this little poem by, I um, forget the name of the, the guy, but one of the developers of, of Python. I don't think it was Guido. Uh, but it pretty much has a, a list of things. Uh, beautiful is better than complex, or beautiful is better than ugly. Uh, explicit is better than implicit. Sparse is better than dense. Well, when you're dealing with the REST API, it's a little bit better to use implicit properties. What I mean by that is use the defaults, because the REST API is smart. It will go and populate defaults that are correct or preferable for your version of APIC. And then for things that you don't populate there, 
it'll automatically fill them in. So you're able to just sort of build a very simple configuration on your side and then have APIC fill it out. The same thing applies for tree structures. You want to make them rather sparse as opposed to dense. So when you go and you build out uh, an EPG, don't go and build out all of the monitoring policies underneath there. Don't go and build out all of the relationships that are sort of implicit, that already exist there. Just build out the defaults that are necessary. Uh, and the reason to avoid that is because adding those in there is going to bloat your code and just make it very, very full. Uh, this next one, I mean, this is like, when I first started learning Python, I thought it was so great that I could just say, from a particular package or module, import star, because then I don't have to type the entire uh, namespace of it. And then I quick re quickly realized that I was running into situations like this, right? What I was doing is I was clobbering objects in my namespace. So within the object model of ACI, there's about 5,300 objects. And those 5,300 objects do have namespace collisions. They do have uh, identif identical names between different namespaces. So if you go and get into the practice of saying, from an entire package, import a particular class, you might need to use another class, and then you're going to clobber the namespace of the first one. So instead, I would recommend one of two things. Either import your namespaces and maintain them individually, or use aliases to avoid the clobbering of different objects in different namespaces. Uh, this last one, server-side filtering, this is, again, you, know, you want to go and, and minimize the amount of information that's tra being transported over the network. So given that we have that really powerful querying and filtering interface, leverage that as much as you can. It might be a little bit difficult to get the query working just the way you want it, but practice. Take a few shots at it. Email me. I can probably help you with it. And then you'll get back a smaller set of data. So in this case, I want to find the, the managed object for interface 1.1 on node 101. So what I do is I do a, a class query for a particular node. I filter on that node. And then I say, I want to get the children where the child name is fabric path EP. And then what I get back is a list of the interfaces on there, which is actually going to be lifted in uh, Cobra 103 that will allow for me to just return the DN of that interface. So it, it, instead of getting a list of all of these objects, all of these fabric path endpoints, I can get just a specific one, which will greatly increase the execution time. How are others using this, right? So again, I've mentioned that a lot of partners are using the REST API for taking businesses where they're based or where, where they specialize in modeling applications, business rules, the workflows, and then converting those into something else useful in IT infrastructure. So what we see is, I don't know what's going on with the screen here, but uh, what we see here is that you could take a direct translation of the business rules and apply those into application-centric policy. Uh, another use case of where we're seeing it large deployments, automated deployments, making large uh, repeated steps and doing those uh, uh, very, very quickly. Within Cisco, we're, we're heavily leveraging the REST API. All of the testing for APIC is done using the REST API, using Cobra, to fully automate and QA the development process. Uh, within advanced services, we use it for automating test beds for customers and making sure that the functionality that we guarantee is working for their environment. And then finally, Cisco IT itself is heavily, lev heavily leveraging the APIC automation uh, of, of uh, capabilities. So I think that, I mean, hopefully, you guys have gotten an idea as to how powerful the REST API is. You see that people are using it today. Uh, it's, it's a really powerful way to manage and interact with the data. And it's going to knowing it is going to really increase your value as an engineer, as a developer, being able to go up the stack and deal more closely with applications, be able to sort of merge your skill sets and be more effective as a engineer and as a person. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate you coming. Uh, I know we're, we're uh, finishing just on time, but if you have any questions, please come and ask. Thank you so much. Have a great day.